Chapter 15 of Deliver Me from Ava by Paul Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. Chapter 15 I hadn't realized the extreme size of Castleman until he suddenly and noiselessly appeared in the concrete passageway immediately behind the screeching, frothing Inza. My own hysterical cry of relief at sight of him was not missed by the maid. She whirled and with moaning fury was at him in an instant. Her spring, straight at his throat, was like that of a maddened, flesh-starved wolf. I saw her grab Castleman by the scalp, locks, and chin, and before I could stride ten steps toward them, she was hunting for his neck with her teeth. I saw Castleman's hands grab her shoulders. I saw his strong arms bend her backwards. But it was my own quick yank at Enza's yellow hair that alone saved him from the death clamp of her teeth. In that brief second, I slipped my other arm between them, bore them back upon my left leg, and tripped them both to the floor. Castleman, with a heavy grunt, seized the advantage. A moment later he had pinioned the maid Ensa safely and securely to the cement. "'Your necktie,' he grunted. "'You dirty, dirty, dirty!' Ensa howled. I stripped the cravat from my neck and helped hold Enza while he tied her hands behind her. "'Now you'll kill me!' Enza screeched. "'Just like you did before, you dirty, dirty, dirty!' The air was horrible with the weird noises and howled invectives that rolled like a foul and unclean torrent from her lips. I was glad when Castleman's handkerchief as mouth gag finally put an end to it. "'Will you assist me, sir, in getting Enza back to her room?' "'Gladly,' I agreed, and together we lugged the writhing woman to the elevator. Upstairs we carried her to the plain little room which was her quarters in the cradle of light. The concavity of its south wall and the peculiar shape of its second doorway marked it as a part of the great circle patterned about the doctor's atelier. While Castleman pinioned Enza on her bed, I untied her wrists and pocketed my badly wrinkled necktie. He turned her loose, still gagged, and we beat our hasty retreat. A second later, Castleman had securely turned the lock on Enza's door. The howls we soon were hearing from behind it were indicative of how quickly and effectively she had ripped the handkerchief from her mouth. "'Thank you for your help,' Castleman said. "'She's in a nasty state. How long will it last? I asked. She'll likely be all right tomorrow. It hasn't upset the doctor's plans for me? Somehow I was greatly concerned about this. No, the glandular transplants already had been removed, and if you'll go on in, sir, I'll carry the head back to the laboratory. Meticulously, Castleman brushed the cellar dust from his sleeves and trousers. With the howls of the mad one at our backs, we followed the hall back to the elevator, as we reached it, Margot stepped from its door. Her face bore the marks of unutterable grief, and her eyes were swollen with late weeping. I knew then that she had seen the ghastly sight below, and I could have strangled Insa at the thought of the needless heartache she had caused. "'Who did it?' Margot half-whispered. "'The girl,' Castleman replied. "'I'd rather never to have been born than to see it,' she sighed. "'And Inza. Poor, broken Enza. She couldn't have known. I'm sorry, Margot, I said, in all the tender sympathy I so deeply felt. The blight of hell must be upon my family, she groaned. And please, Castleman, do handle it with care. I shall, Margot, he said. With a polite bow, Castleman stepped into the elevator car, and the gliding door removed us from his gruesome mission. "'Shall we go into the study?' I asked, taking Margot's arm. "'No,' she said, drawing away. "'I'm meeting the doctor in the atelier.' She turned. Fright seized me at the look of stark panic on her face. "'Are you submitting to this thing?' she suddenly asked. "'Am I to see the image of my own son transmuted to a stranger?' "'My dear Margot,' I hastened to explain. "'I—' "'I'm sorry,' she said in calmer voice, striving for control. "'Tis—' "'All right, Mark,' she added, her moment of hysteria now passed. She took my hand. She squeezed it comfortingly. "'Tis all right.' My heart went out to the bereaved woman, but try as I might, there was nothing I could say. Apparently she sensed my concern, for her smile toward me was pathetic in its tenderness. "'Did I understand you to say the doctor was here?' I asked in an effort to lift the somber tone of our conversation. "'He's waiting.' "'But I left him at Thalamus, not twenty minutes ago.' "'He has his own way of coming and going,' she replied. "'He'll be ready for you, and I'm assisting.' 
You don't want to assist? N no, she hesitantly answered. No, I don't. I cannot tell you why, but I'd rather not again stand at the side of Dr. Craner. And yet, who else can? It will take more than Castleman's help. Doctor needs me. You need me. It is for the sake of you and Ava that I am here this morning. Thank you, Margot. I said. You are aware now of my unfortunate status in the family. Reasons for my lack of sympathy with the doctor's course should be obvious. I nodded, and swiftly appraised and pondered the amazing revelations concerning this family. I could easily understand Margot's antipathy toward the genius she had nurtured, and by whom she had been discarded. Jealousy, rebellion, and a hate blinded by frustrated maternal love, doubtless all were tumultuously seething in Margot's breast. The shock of Osmond's death was something any mother, even one grounded in the Craner tradition, would find difficult to bear. I could understand, too, why she did not want me to submit to the transplant, but here a reckoning was to be made with my new state of feelings. From the premise of my rebirth, her very resistance to the surgery made her my enemy. I could deeply sympathize in every tragic problem she faced, but I could not condone even the thought of her raising objection to the thing my whole conscious soul desired. Nothing must turn me from the great experiment. I fiercely wanted this thing, this day. I would have killed anyone daring to raise a hand to stop me. You are Ava's mother and my friend, I said, and I respect you greatly. Thank you, Mark, she replied, and may the unseen powers guide you through this thing. She pressed my arm reassuringly and wanly smiled. A last fierce scream echoed from Enza's room. Margot shuddered and again dabbed her eyes. Shall we go? I asked, resolutely stepping forward. The doctor will be waiting. And so side by side we walked toward the doctor's great circular atelier, thoughts holding our tongues to silence. The mystery of the doctor's quick traverse of the two houses was heckling me for answer, but even that was insignificant compared to the buoyant state of my feelings as the moment for the great adventure grew imminent. To explain the rapture which possessed me would be difficult. The bizarre and the ugly had resolved itself to the commonplace. Anything outside the train of my normal experience quickly rationalized itself in my mind. Osmond's head dashed against my shoulder came not as a basis for horror, but as a source of hate directed at Enza for having disturbed the expected sequence of things. The oddity of Ava's mother conducting me to the surgical table, her presence as a menial in the family, all the out-of-ordinary things my eyes had witnessed since my marriage, had lost their strangeness in this hour. And when Margot opened the door into the circled room, I was ready. And I was happy. The table was prepared for me. The great doctor sat upon his pedestal at its head, and Castleman had shed his butler's tails for a surgical gown. A quick, cold glance of recognition passed between Margot and Dr. Craner, and in silence she stepped to the washroom to prepare herself. The doctor pointed to a door in the circle. "'You will disrobe in there,' he said. "'I want you naked to the waist. You'll find pajama trousers laid out for you.' Obediently I opened the door and stepped inside the dressing room. The lower half of a pair of white linen pajamas and a pair of cloth boots were readied on the small white table in the little room. With eagerness of a small child preparing for a swim, I stripped and hung my clothes upon the hangers in the closet. By the time I had donned cloth boots and pajama pants, Castleman had arrived with razor and soaps. He flung a heavy towel about my bare shoulders and pinned it at the neck. "'Will you be seated, sir?' he said. "'Beside the lavatory, please.' "'Must you cut my hair?' He politely nodded and hooked the leather strop to a wall catch, expertly played a barber's tattoo upon it with the gleaming blade of his razor. He folded the razor, laid it aside, and picked up the clippers. "'Bend over, please,' he requested. Methodically, Castleman guided the clippers and swath after swath across my head. In mild interest, I watched my gray-streaked black hair tumble to the floor at my feet. And when that was done... I bent myself to the porcelain basin while my scalp was lathered and shaved. For the first time that day I felt impotent and weak. In that hour I could believe the legend of Samson and his shorn locks had some basis in fact. There is nothing in the world that will 
more quickly and surely rob a man of confidence, poise, and courage than a shaved head. The strange creature who now stared at me from the room's mirror struck me with actual fright. My sense of nakedness was appalling. We'll return now, sir, Castleman obsequiously declared. God, but I am a sight, I groaned, stealing one last glance at the mirror. Did you have to do this? It's necessary, sir. Surgical preparation. God help me. And my love life, I tragically sighed. But not even the shock of my shaved scalp could deter me from the desire which had been implanted in my soul. I followed Castleman into the big room, and with my inability to further view my Samsonian tragedy, my confidence returned. Margot had changed to a tie-back surgical gown. Now her large and hungry eyes peered strangely at me from above her muslin face mask. If anything could have furthered the grotesque appearance of Dr. Craner, the trappings of surgery was it. The sterile gown, while fitting him tightly across the shoulders, was shortened to his dwarf stature, and hung several inches below the top line of his pedestal. With no ears to anchor the mask, a special harness had been contrived, which fitted across his bald and shiny pate. Unlike Osman and Margot, he wore no cap, and the electric skull buttons which served for ears shone black and mysterious behind the gauze shield now covering the lower part of his face. I saw the two large eyes staring critically at me. I heard his vibrant voice, and it was tender and solicitous. "'That's it,' he said as I climbed to the table. "'Now lie flat on your back. Breathe deeply. Relax if you can.' I felt a cold and sterile sheet below my naked shoulders. I stared upward to the windowed ceiling, and quite unconsciously my eyes sought the blue light which glowed from above. I heard Castleman scrubbing up for the affair in the side washroom. I heard Margot's feet treading about the tiled floor. My sense was one of expectancy, without curiosity, without fear. I shall induce sleep, the doctor was saying. Under ordinary conditions, such induced sleep would be complete and satisfactory. However, the mechanical disturbance of the brain cells necessary in our task this morning may adversely affect the catalepsis. We'll administer an opiate as precautionary measure. I heard the swish of Margot's gown. I heard the tread of her feet beside me. An enameled tray was hooked into the slots of the table and I stole a glance at the two hypodermic syringes lying in gauze pads upon its top. I felt the sting of their needles, one in each shoulder. A moment later Castleman was there, masked and gowned. Margot took away the spent hypodermics. While she was gone, Castleman covered my nakedness with sterile sheets and then strapped me securely to the table. When Margot returned, the new tray was laden with sterile rubber gloves and talc, I watched lethargically while both she and Castleman re-scrubbed at the washroom to return soon for the glove-donning ritual. I watched interestedly the sprinkling of the talc, Castleman's stretch of the gloves, the plunge of Margot's hand deep to the finger ends. I heard the crisp snap and crackle of the rubber about the sleeve ends of her gown. The doctor's gloves lay on the tray, ready, though first must come the task of rendering his patient helpless and insensible. The drug had commenced to work, and I felt stupidly drowsy. Not the least sense of rebellion or fright had yet crept into my consciousness. My will to do this thing could not be explained. My trust in the doctor was absolute. Soon I heard his soothingly vibrant voice, directing my eyes to the light, suggesting the deep sleep soon to come. I felt his strong hands knead, press, and stroke my skull. Dimly I heard the rattle of surgical instruments as Castleman prepared for the opening and closing of a human head. Sleep, sleep, the doctor's voice droned in my ear. And soon, like the snap of a switch, my life was severed from its known and familiar world. End of chapter 15